Specialty Story, session number 40. Whether you're a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you will want to practice. This podcast is here to tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information you need to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. Welcome to Specialty Stories. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, your host here every week, as well as the host of many other podcasts at mededmedia.com. That's M-E-D-E-D media.com. Today, I have a great guest who is practicing a specialty that is relatively new but very, very important. In the United States, obesity and around the world is becoming more and more of a problem, but here in the US, obesity and being overweight affects two thirds of our population. And our guest today, Dr. Alexandra Soa, is trying to change that as an obesity medicine specialist. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We start the conversation by talking about how she initially got interested in obesity medicine. I had no idea what obesity medicine was, but I was first interested in it at the age of 16. And obesity medicine wasn't really even a specialty then, but I was part of one of those scholar med um, invitationals. And it was in Washington, D.C., and it was a few days over the summer. And there was a speaker named Dr. Pamela Peak, who is still in practice, and she's affiliated with the University of Maryland. She gave an amazing speech about prevention and the role that prevention plays in good medicine. And I walked away from that event being like, I want to go into public health. I love this idea. This is what I'm meant to do. And I want to prevent disease. And so it was always in my head. Uh, Even when I went to college, I went to Johns Hopkins and I majored in public health. I, I had a double major actually in public health and writing. And I kind of struggled with the idea of should I do this traditional public health on a mass scale or go to medical school, which was kind of always my interest. And I thought, I'm going to go to med school and I'm going to do prevention. But this wasn't really a thing when I was applying. And in uh, medical school, I, I wasn't exposed to it much, but it was always something that I carried with me. So when I finally found obesity medicine, in the middle of my internal medicine residency, I was like, this is it. I want to manage disease and prevent it from progressing to the main diseases that we kind of think of in internal medicine, like hypertension and diabetes and sleep apnea and osteoarthritis, cholesterol problems. I want to get to the root cause of it. And that is when I was like, obesity medicine, that's it. That's what I want to do. What traits do you think lead to being a good obesity medicine doc? Uh, Primarily compassion and openness. There is uh, an intense amount of stigma around treating, managing, being a person who carries excess weight. Um, And you need to be aware of how difficult it can be to be a patient who is overweight I do use the word obese, and I am proud to proclaim that I'm an obesity medicine doctor. Um, And you need to know that that comes with many years of beating yourself up about how much you weigh and people treating you differently. And doctors even a lot of times will say to me, I hate that population of people. Like, I can't believe that's what you want to specialize in. So primarily, I think it's compassion um, and just a willingness to be open um, to understanding that it is a disease and it's multifactorial and it's not just a lack of willpower um, that leads someone to have excess weight. Um, And then you got to be like, I think, think a little bit of a cowboy because it's not an established, it's not a well-established field. Um, It wasn't until I think it was 2011 that the American Board of Obesity Medicine was formed, really formalized, streamlined their board process. And so there aren't many specialists. So you kind of have to have, be a little... (laughs) a little bit of a risk taker, think outside the box um, and kind of carve your own path in that 
regard. And then, you know, at the foundation to any specialty is just being really good at your primary training. So I, I'm an internist, and I think you still need to be a really good generalist to be a good specialist. You talked about how you knew you were interested in prevention from an early age. As you were going through your training, was there another specialty that was pulling at you along the way? Endocrine. Yeah, absolutely. Up until the very end, it was I thought I was going to be an endocrinologist. And I thought this kind of managing obesity uh, and all the disease that comes along with it would have to only be through the pathway of endocrine. Um, and sometimes I still, like, I love that field and I do wish maybe I had a, a little bit more training um, and would never have to refer out to the endocrinologist, but I'm pretty happy that I ended my training, my formal training when I did. Okay. What types of diseases, pathologies, patients are you seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? Diabetes is a big one. So people will come, um, will say, I don't want to progress to insulin. How can I manage this through diet and lifestyle? Um, and most doctors do not know that there is a way to manage many, most people who are type 2 diabetics with diet. Um, and so I see a lot of that. I see people who have uh, fatty liver or just joint pains, uh, sleep apnea, all of these, these problems are related to excess weight. Uh, and so people are like, I don't want to be on a sleep apnea machine. Can you help me lose 25 pounds? And then I just see people who are like, I've been overweight and I just keep the, you know, the scale keeps going up. I don't have any huge other pathology other than my, my BMI is now in the obese range. Um, and it helped me. So, uh, I see people who are just a little overweight to morbid obesity. And I also see people who are of normal weight but have metabolic abnormalities. So HDLs are really low. LDLs are really high. Um, they are pre-diabetics. And they just want to know what they can do to prevent the progression of disease. Before we jump into a typical day, you recently moved into a private practice and starting your own practice. What was the decision behind starting your own practice versus working in another clinic? Uh, my idea of what being a doctor is, I think is very old fashioned. I really like the idea of ownership of your practice and your patients and autonomy and really being able to create your own schedule and create the relationships with patients that you want. And I felt in my previous um, large practice employed job, there was just a focus on the bottom line and the amount having to see a lot of patients per hour. And in obesity medicine, you just can't, you can't do it effectively in a 20 minute slot. And so you sacrifice what you're offering to the patient. Um, there, you know, there are uh, five FDA-approved medications for long-term uh, long use in weight loss. And if you're offered a 20-minute slot, you can write a prescription in 20 minutes, but you can't do much of the count. The really important work is in the counseling, the um, discussion and, and personalized discussion about diet and exercise and talking about all of the things that go into how you're eating a certain way, why you're eating a certain way. How did you get to this point? What are your goals? You can't do that effectively and kindly and compassionately in 20 minutes. So I decided I'm going to go off on my own and I am going to practice medicine the way I want. So the only way to do that is open up your own practice. <laughs> You talked about the in-depth discussion about nutrition and diet and everything. I think one of the, the biggest complaints about physicians is they don't know enough about nutrition and diet. How have you gained that knowledge? So it is so true. I think in my medical school, I'm not even sure if we once touched on nutrition in medical school. In residency, you might have been taught, check a BMI and then tell them to eat less and exercise more. Um, there was one clinic at Bellevue Hospital that was focusing on nutrition and it was within the bariatrics clinic. Um, and it, it's still kind of under the mantra of a little bit of the food pyramid, the traditional food pyramid. So that's the only exposure I got. 
except I had found this field and I sought out board certified experts. And I was lucky enough to get to rotate with Dr. Lou Aroni at Wild Cornell. And he is like the godfather of the field. Um, he started doing research back 25 plus years ago and has just really been a pioneer in making this, making this a field. And so it was eye opening just to get to work with him and I can be exposed to his clinic. And so that is where I started to realize that there is, it's not only diet, but it can be pharma, pharmacology. And the diet piece, I'd say even came in more after residency. And as I was working toward my board certification, I just started reading, 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 and reading outside of what were like the traditional textbooks that were given to me in my internal medicine re uh, residency and were much more on the nutrition front and attending conferences. And I, through that, then made connections with people who were doing dietary modification in ways that blew my mind. So down at Duke, they have a really amazing multidisciplinary um, group that does diets in different ways. So they have like a very low calorie diet. They have a ketogenic diet, so a very low carbohydrate diet. Um, and then they have like meal replacement diet. So they kind of tailor make the plan just for the patient and what works for them. And that was eye opening to me. And since then, I um, have now become much more in control of the diet plans that I create for patients. So I actually don't use nutritionists uh, nearly as much as I do when I started out because I feel like it was just uh, something that I needed to teach myself so I could really have that great relationship with patients. And, and it seems it, it's working out really well. What does a typical day look like for you, knowing that you've made all of these recent changes in your practice? Uh, so a typical day. So I, um, I think when you're talking about any person in medicine, you kind of have to think first, like, what do you want? You have to think about what you want your life to be like. And so I've made a conscious decision, um, to split some of my time up very in, into like boxes. And I'm a mom of two young kids. So actually Two of my days are spent at home. I wouldn't say that I'm a stay-at-home mom those those days because I do have a little bit of help. So some of my office work is done in the mornings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But um, right now, Mondays, Wednesday, Fridays, I'm in the office. And uh, I come in probably 8.30 and I start seeing patients at 9. And I'm really lucky in my new practice. I am dedicating 40 to 60 minutes with each patient that comes in. So I'm don't, I'm not, I'm no longer seeing 20 patients a day. Um, and I see patients, I do admin work, you know, you still can't get away from notes no matter what kind of practice you have. <laughs> um, I'm working on meal plans. I'm doing a lot of virtual correspondence with patients, um, you know, check-ins, more like kind of like coaching along the way. Like every two weeks I'll check in with a patient. Where are you? How are you doing? Is everything going well with your, your, are we on track with our exercise plan, our, um, our dieting? And how about the, how the medications working out? You know, and, and it's a nice little reminder of patients like, yeah, hey, my doctor is invested in this, this with me. Um, and so that's so, yeah. So I have very typical office days on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm also building up a new practice. And so there's a lot of, learning a new skill set. Like I'm a small business owner now. So there's accounting and there's lawyers and uh, there's dealing with insurance and, and things like that. So that takes up a little bit more time right now because I'm at the start of my business and I'm hoping in two years, but it's, it's still a good balance. Not a common question on this show, but because you were talking earlier about how this is kind of a, a new kind of niche in internal medicine with obesity medicine, how have insurance companies taken to looking at what you're doing and, and reimbursing you for it? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, they don't reimburse very well. And I have made a conscious decision to step outside of the insurance model 
to do this in my new practice. Um, just so I don't have to compromise my care right now. I'm hoping that as more data comes out and insurance companies realize that, hey, it makes a really big difference in 10 to 20 years if we are able to take 10% body weight off of an obese person, we are preventing a slew of diseases and thus a lot of money is saved. Um, so maybe we should start you know, focusing in on the specialty. But at the moment, it's not so great. As your practice progresses, are you seeing that you'll have to take a lot of call? Uh, hmm. well, so I'm a split internist and, um, obesity medicine. So I have a partner and we're kind of doing 50, 50 call. Do I think that this is a specialty obesity medicine where you need call? No. Um, there really aren't a lot of emergencies. Uh, I do use medications and on the rare chance someone has a reaction that that would be an, an, like a weekend or a night call. Um, and sometimes if we're dealing with a specific bariatric population, uh, meaning they just had surgery, that might warrant some urgent follow-up. But it's not something with a very heavy out-of-office hours burden. Do you feel like the way that your practice will be set up or the way that it is now that you'll have good time for a family as much as you want? As much as I want? Uh, I don't know if it's – I don't know – I still don't know what the answer to that perfect balance is, but I have specifically um, cho- I've made a few big decisions along the way to prioritize my family. I And I don't think this is something that women or men should be afraid to talk about. I think it's really important. I think traditionally in medicine, you just kind of grin, bear it, you get pregnant, you deal with it. People sometimes judge you, sometimes they don't, sometimes they help you, sometimes they don't, but The fact of the matter is doctors train for a very long time. And somewhere along that way, if you're a female, there's chances are you're going to have a baby. So I had a baby um, at the end of my third year of internal medicine residency. And it was while being pregnant that year that I decided to not apply for a fellowship and to pursue this path because my heart was really just in this one track. And um, that was probably the first decision I made that said, hey, I'd like to step outside of training because I'll have a little bit more control over my hours. I chose a job right out of residency where I did not, was not working five days a week. Um, I had a little bit more time at home with my my son. And then I had a second baby. And uh, my second son is now one. And um, I still decided to go ahead with this practice, even though it's a lot of work. Uh, I'll get to make my own hours. And that is why I'm doing it, too. Get to make my own hours, kind of decide when and how much I want to work. And no one is telling me how much or when to work. And I think that that, on one hand, you got to work a lot owning a business. Um, but it's working for myself and that makes me feel like it's all worth it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Talk about the the training path. So, you're internal medicine trained without a fellowship. Do you see obesity medicine becoming more and more common with a fellowship or or can anybody that's internal medicine trained be an obesity medicine doc? So, it's so Just to back up a little bit, obesity medicine is so important because two-thirds of our country are overweight or obese right now, Uh, and it's it's been a huge population that's been underserved. So obesity medicine, I'd say, covers the whole umbrella of anyone treating anybody who has excess weight to lose and doing it in a thoughtful and kind of a trained manner. Um, So... My field does include surgeons and uh, um, pediatricians and internists and family medicine and OBGYN. Actually, it is not just limited to internal medicine. Um, You can actually sit for the boards, I believe, with any specialty. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So I, I said earlier that the American Board of Obesity Medicine was founded in 2011. At that point, they created a track out of training. You have to be board certified in your primary specialty. You have to have gone to medical school, be an MD or DO. And 
certified in your primary specialty, and then you have to accrue a certain amount of credits, attend conferences. It's over about a two-year period. It's pretty regimented. And then you are qualified to sit for the boards. And um, so there, there is also a fellowship option. And when I was looking to become certified a few years ago, there were not many fellowships. Now, the field is exploding. And so in the past few years, even in the area where I live in, in New York City, there are there were no fellowships three years ago. And now I believe there are four in this surrounding area. So uh, I don't know what that means for this requirement right now where you don't have to go to a fellowship. I don't know. I, I, I can't speak for the... ABOM, but right now there are two paths. One is you don't need a fellowship, and one is you can have a fellowship. Um, I think a fellowship would have been great. And a one year fellowship, if I would have had the opportunity to have access to one without having to move and relocate my family, would have been great. It would have been really nice to learn from more seasoned mentors. Now, I've just had to be more creative in how I've done that outside of the fellowship. Um, and I have, but it just has, it wasn't as easy as like going into work every day and learning from someone who's more senior. So, um, either way I think is a great option. And I think that they, the test is pretty hard. So you really have to put all of your effort into being a self learner. This is not something that you're just going to be able to sit down and take. Um, and the big societies, the, uh, the Obesity Society and the Obesity Medicine Association have fantastic ongoing lectures and conferences and access to new content and are creating their own journals. So the field is just full of content. And I think doing something like this, something that's kind of new, you really have to be dedicated to being a self-learner, to being excited about being on the forefront of research, um, kind of soaking everything up you can so that you just grow with the field as it grows. Great. Thank you. What do you wish primary care providers, or I guess any providers you mentioned earlier can kind of do this, what do you wish they knew more about obesity medicine and taking care of, of our obese and overweight population? It is not a lack of willpower. So... I think that's the number one misconception and what makes patients so disappointed in the healthcare system is that for years they're told to lose weight, but no one tells them how. Um, You wouldn't believe the amount of patients that I have who are, you know, existing on like 1,100 calories a day and are going to the gym six days a week and doing everything that everyone has always kind of traditionally told them, but it isn't working for for them and their bodies. So it is that obesity, excess weight, metabolic disease is multifactorial, and it goes all the way back to how much your mom gained during pregnancy, what kind of birth you had, if you were breastfed, if you weren't, um, your genes are a huge part of it. Uh, and then just kind of your weight along the way. And it's so many factors. It's not just calories in, calories out. And I think that's the biggest misconception that physicians have um, and the public has at large. So it's just, I would really encourage if any doctors or medical students out there, it, it is not, it's not as simple as this traditional model that we've always learned. It's complex and there are new ways of tackling it and try not to be closed-minded. And I think sometimes like diet, the word diet medication or diet doctor or diet even has gotten such a bad rap, a bad connotation that people roll their eyes and are like, oh geez, that's just a fax, fast fix. Um, and it's just not true. You know, we really have so everyone's difference. Everyone needs to be treated in a different manner. What other specialties do you work the closest with? I would say endocrine because I do, people come to me for weight loss and then you end up picking up pituitary tumors or, you know, Cushingoid uh, features or there's very complex diabetes that we're not managing adequately uh, with just diet or medications. And so I I would probably be endocrine. Um, In my field too, um, so this is a little bit outside of 
obesity medicine, but because of my interest, my strong interest in now training and nutrition, I'd say the other specialty that's at the top of the list is gastroenterology. I do treat and see a lot of patients who have IBD and help them to manage bowel disease with uh, specific diets and ways of eating and kind of looking at food as medicine. So those would probably be the top two. Oh, and then uh, uh, actually maybe the top would be at bariatric surgeons also. So they're more like I refer out or see their patients afterward. Okay. Do you see any special opportunities for obesity medicine specialists outside of clinical medicine? Absolutely. I mean, this is just such an area that's ripe for education. So not every person has to go see an obesity medicine doctor. You know, a lot of people can make some of the changes of the tools that we have on their own. So I think that if anyone is interested in writing, um, you know, doing Facebook live videos, I think that there's a huge opportunity for people to connect with the public at large um, with the information that the specialty provides people with. What do you know now about obesity medicine that you wish you knew back before you started your training? Uh, I wish I, I wish I would have been more aggressive in creating research content within the field and connecting with mentors. I think it took me a while to find other people who were in the field. And I realize now out of my training that people are happy to connect and people are happy to help you, especially in this field, because they're so passionate about it and they want to see it continue to grow at the rate that it has. Um, and so I would have gotten a little bit more into research and made more connections earlier on. What do you like the most about your specialty? I change people's lives. I help people who for years have not been able to take off a single pound or worse, have gained and gained and gained when the traditional medical system has failed them. And either they end up on a lot of medications or just hopeless and they come to me and they start losing weight for the first time in their lives. They start peeling off their hypertension medications, their diabetes medications, the NSAIDs for their joint pains. They take off the CPAP for their sleep apnea and they, they cry tears of joy when they come back to see me because it's the first time someone treated their obesity as a disease and, and treating it that way, they were able to kind of manage all of their other diseases and reverse them. That's profound. Uh, I had a patient last year write me a Valentine's Day card and say that I was the best Valentine's Day present she'd ever had <laughs> because that year she had lost 50 pounds. Um, and that's just, that's profound. What do you like the least? You can't fix everyone. So, and it's hard work. It takes time and it's emotional and it's complex. So my, my dad's a hand surgeon and he, when he takes someone in for surgery, he knows that he's going to be able to fix them. Or if not, he manages expectations and you come out in six weeks, you're, you don't have your carpal tunnel anymore, you can move your digit. It's not that way with obesity medicine. You can't guarantee everyone that they come when they come to you that you're going to give them exactly what they want. I always say to everyone, we're just here to make you a little bit healthier. And then the weight that comes off is bonus. And that's how I approach every patient. But I know that some people are still disappointed and, and it's, it's tough. There's no, there is no fast fix. It's hard work on all fronts. So that's, that's what can be disappointing. What major changes do you see coming to the field of obesity medicine? We are just learning so much. We didn't even know what hunger uh, and appetite suppression hormones were until 15 years ago. So the fact that we now know that there is a hormone released from the antrum of the stomach that just tells you to keep eating um, is revolutionary. So we now have new, we're going to see new novel treatments 
for the treatment of the disease at the, the, the level of the pathology. So I think that is going to explode. And I also think this field of understanding the gut microbiome is going to really change obesity medicine too. So I think there's a lot of really fascinating basic research that is going to uh, translate quickly to clinical medicine. And I think, and I'm hopeful that in the course of my career, it is just, you know, it's a field where we go from five medications to we go to hundred and we can really target them to each individual patient. If you had to do it all over again, would you still choose what you're doing now? I would. I love it. Any last words of wisdom for a pre-med or a medical student going through this process, just learning about obesity medicine, hearing you talk um, for them to I, get involved? Yeah, I think that you need to listen to that little voice inside of your head that led you into medicine in the first place. I did not even know that this specialty existed, but there was something in me from the age of 16 that said, I want to prevent disease. That is what I want to do. I, I really, I never went to medical school to, well, I learned to treat disease, but that was never my motivator. It was to prevent disease. And so I'm getting to do that now and it, it is totally fulfilling. But when I described that to people who were in the traditional model of medicine, that made little sense to them. Um, and I could have easily been discouraged. And in fact, when I was in my medical school training, I was at an institution where um, to specialize was kind of the only way to show your strength and your intelligence. Uh, and so even going into internal medicine or originally, um, I, I I didn't have great mentorship. It wasn't necessarily encouraged, but for me, it was the kind of the broadest. And I knew that there I could probably have the widest grasp of understanding and of how to prevent disease. Um, so just follow your gut. I, I think I'm exactly where I should be in my career and I feel very fulfilled. Um, and also I would give encouragement to people think outside of the box. It is easy to become so beaten down by the routine of all of the years of schooling and training that we need to do, which is so important, so, so important, but it becomes exhausting and you don't necessarily get to use that other side of your brain that thinks, what's next and how can I do this? How can I make my own life? So think a little bit outside of the box and know that there are opportunities outside of the traditional um, of, of traditional academia and you can carve out your own little niche and, and patients will be so thankful the right, when the right patients find you, they'll be so thankful that, that you are there, um, because you'll be offering something different. All right. So there you have it. Dr. Alexandra Soa, you can check out her website at alexandrasoamd.com. I hope you gained a lot of great information out of this podcast today. Maybe opened up your eyes to a specialty that maybe you've never heard of before and it really interests you. That is the goal of this podcast. If there's a specialty that you think is obscure and I might not hear about it, email me, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net, and I'll add it to our list of specialties. I'm always looking for new physicians to interview, so if you know any physicians, maybe your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, uh, maybe they would like to come on this podcast. Again, just shoot me an email, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here at Specialty Stories.